Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, just a sound check. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, very nice, very well. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you so much for joining our side event uh, on food system transformation as an accelerator for the Agenda 2030 and the African Union Agenda uh, 2063 Implementation Africa Lessons and Insights from the Frontline. Uh, this event is co-organized by the United Nations Food System Coordination Hub, the Economic Commission for Africa, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, as, you, as you very well know, uh, the, the Hub is organizing a series of events, including regional meeting and side events, uh, as a follow-up to the stock-taking moment, which took place last year, July 2023. The object of this meeting is to keep the connection with the Food System National Convener, to keep the momentum around food system transformation as an important accelerator for Agenda 2030, and also to get insights from the regions uh, and from countries on their efforts to transform food systems. In Africa, this event uh, is mainly taking place uh, uh, in full coordination with the African Union, with NEPAD, uh, taking into consideration uh, the regional priorities and the work of the African Union and NEPAD in supporting Food System Transformation Agenda 2063. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate the opening session. Uh, in the opening session, we have three speakers. Mr. Uh, David Ferry, uh, who is a special advisor to the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Africa. Uh, Mr. Gottfried Hauiga, Director of Agricultural and Rural Development uh, in the African Union. And Mr. Stephanus Poto, Director of the UN Food System Coordination Hub. Uh, I am not sure if David managed to join. Uh, Michelle, can you confirm if he's online? I know he's not here yet. He has some technical difficulties, but I'm following up with him. Okay, uh, maybe we can give him also a chance maybe at the end of this session. So with this, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Godfrey Bahogad, uh, Director of the Agriculture and Rural Development, African Union, to provide opening remarks, uh, focusing mainly on the role of um, of the African Union Commission in supporting food system transformation fully in line with Agenda 2030 and also the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program. Over to you, Godfrey. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, moderator. Um, as introduced, my name is Godfrey Bahigua. I'm Director of Agriculture and Rural Development at the African Union Commission. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for inviting the African Union to give uh, these opening remarks uh, in this important side event. Um, as background, as you may recall, um, in 2020, uh, 2023, 2021, leading to the uh, UN Food System Summit, the African Union, uh, meaning the African Union Commission together with Oda Nepad, we worked jointly to uh, develop an Africa common position on food systems transformation. And that was presented by our, our Commissioner High Excellence Ambassador Sako uh, in, uh, in New York. And that common position um, has 43 game changing pathways um, for across the five um, tracks of the food systems. So as African Union, uh, we took that moment of the food systems to be uh, an accelerator towards the implementation of CADAP, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. And so as we are mobilizing our member states uh, for that common position, we had in mind that that was a moment that would boost or accelerate the pace of implementation of the CADAP agenda. And the discussion with our member states was that after the, the summit, they would then inter domesticate the commitments or the pathways within their national agricultural investment plans for, for implementation. The second thing that we did um, was that in tracking the implementation of the pathways, we did not want to create a new monitoring framework, because we already had the, the CADAP Banyu review mechanism. So even in the common position, we are very clear that 
in tracking and reporting in the implementation of the food systems pathways, we would use the Cada Banyu review mechanism. And that's exactly what, what we did uh, in 2021. Um, we, we, we used the baseline data for the indicators in the Cada Banyu review report to, um, uh, to try to, to track where countries were as a baseline uh, for the food systems transformation. In 2023 reports, uh, we actually also presented the results uh, both in the traditional manner of the Banyo Review Report, but also according to the um, five tracks of the UN food systems. The last re remark I want to make um, is futuristic. We are at a moment where the African Union um, is leading, has started the process of formulating the post Malabo Kadapa agenda. The successor to the Malabo agenda and we want to make sure that we harvest as much input as possible from different players. So in terms of documentation, of course, the UN food systems common position will be an important source of information, given that it was endorsed by our member states. As we think about the priorities for the next 10 years, we have the Kada Banyo Review Report, um, that was endorsed by member states in February this year. That will be an important uh, document. We are going to undertake regional consultations in all our five AU regions. We are going to undertake technical analysis um, to inform uh, an evidence-based uh, uh, strategy and action plan. And would like to invite as many stakeholders to join the technical working group. There are 13 of them um, and we want uh, input from as many people as possible. So the process has started to formulate the post Malab agenda and would like to invite um, everyone to uh, make a contribution in shaping uh, the CADAP agenda over the next 10 years. Thank you. I'll stop there unless there's a question that I can respond to. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Godfrey. And in fact, uh, the Food System Coordination Hub will be uh, very happy to support all the efforts to follow up on the post Malapo process. Uh, in fact, in the regional meeting that was organized last year in Niger, uh, the, the matter of the post Malabo process was also discussed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Food System Hub is working closely with the African Union, with Commissioner Sacco and yourself uh, to, to follow up on this. Uh, with this, uh, if David is online, um, I am not sure if he managed to join or not. But if not, I would yes. like to. In yes, David, good, good, good that you yes, see you I here. Did. Uh, okay, yes, very... unfortunately, I could not join on uh, uh, on my system for some reason. I was having problems, but so I've joined on the phone. But can you hear me? Very well. And without any delay, I give you the floor to, to welcome the participants this side event and also to speak a little bit about how role in supporting Food System National Convener and the Agri-Food Transformation Africa. Over to you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Godfrey Bahigwa, Director, Agriculture Rural Development, um, African Union Commission. Uh, Mr. Stefanos Fortu, Director, UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish to thank the Food Systems Coordination Hub for extending the kind invitation to FAO to be part of this important event on a subject at the heart of FAO's mission. This side event on the margins of the 10th Africa Regional Forum for Sustainable Development to be held next week in Addis Ababa is an important opportunity to reflect on our commitments and actions on the centrality of the food systems transformation to the Africa's development. From the outset, let me assert that food system transformation is both a prerequisite and an accelerator for UN Agenda 2030 and AU Agenda 2063. Food security and nutrition are essential for physical human growth, for cognitive development, for good health, for poverty reduction, among others. A sustainable food system lies at the heart of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs call for major transformations in agriculture and food systems to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition by 2030. Equally, the 2014 Malabo commitments on agriculture and food security 
themselves aimed at accelerating implementation of the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program agreed in Maputo in 2003, formed the linchpin of the AU Agenda 2063. A sustainable food system can deliver food security and nutrition for all in such a way that economic, social, and environmental basis to generate food security and nutrition for future generations are not compromised. This means it is profitable throughout, has broad-based benefits for society, and it has a positive or neutral impact on the natural environment. It is evident that food systems remain highly vulnerable to shocks and disruptions arising from conflict, climate variability and extremes, and economic contraction. Africa is one of the regions that are most vulnerable to climate variability and change, despite its low contribution to global greenhouse emissions. This is due to many factors, including the continent's biophysical environment, combined with numerous social economic vulnerabilities, including high level dependence on rain fed agriculture, weak livelihoods, widespread poverty and inequality, inadequate preparedness for climate related and man made hazards, among others. Numbers speak for themselves. The prevalence of undernutrition in the world was 735 million in 2022. Africa contributed nearly 20% to that, or 282 million to that number. An increase of 57 million people since COVID-19 pandemic began. Under the best case scenario, rather than zero hunger expected through SDG2, the world will have 600 million persons undernourished in 2030. A large proportion of these will be in Africa. Meanwhile, the just released Africa Union's biennial review shows that not a single Af a country in Africa is on, is on track to reach the Malabo commitments by 2025. The end point of the Malabo commitment zero hunger challenge. The 2021 Food Systems Summit provided an opportunity to maximize the core benefits of a food systems approach across the entire 2030 agenda. The food systems stock taking moment held in 2023 has called upon stakeholders to align the implementation of the national food systems transformation pathways with all other relevant SDGs. Despite the many formidable challenges that the African continent faces, opportunities exist. Recent trends driving food, agri food systems in the region are providing new opportunities to unleash the continent's food and agribusiness potential. One, growing food markets estimated to reach $1 trillion by 2030 provide attractive investment opportunities for investing in the food and agriculture sector. Two, an integrated market from the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement with a combined GDP of about $3 trillion US dollars and over 1 million people can boost intra-African agriculture trade. Third, a continent with the youngest and fastest growing population worldwide, a rapidly urbanizing population and rising number of households with discretionary income provide significant economies of scale and scope to attract investments into food and agribusiness with strong upstream and downstream linkages to manufacturing and other growth or industrial sectors. Fourthly, technology and innovation, including digitalization, are creating new opportunities to accelerate transformation of agri-food systems. So there is hope for food system transformation, even in Africa, if we take advantage of the opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I posit that without food system transformation, we will not make any progress towards the other SDGs and the UH and the AU Agenda 2063. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, David. And uh, you, you explained very well how food system transformation can lead to, to changes on the ground, uh, leading to the acceleration of the implementation of the SDGs. For Africa, as you said, uh, despite all the challenges, the potential of food system uh, is, is very high. Uh, there are many opportunities for, uh, for using food systems 
to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. As you said, uh, the potential of the agricultural sector, the African continental free trade area, and, and the work at the regional level supported by the UN system. Uh, with this, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Stephanos Foto, Director of the UN Food System Coordination Hub, to provide us with some updates on the work of the hub in supporting national conveners. I, I know, Stephanos, you are joining us from Chile, where there, there's a series of regional meetings with national conveners on, on all regions. So over to you. Thank you very much, Khaled, and um, good morning, good afternoon from my side. And um, I would like to acknowledge the, the presence of uh, Mr. Godfrey Bahigua and um, my good friend David uh, Piri, good friend and, and, and colleague from FAO. Um, and I thank them very much for having given two frames, one on the Africa food system transformation pathways, and we indeed get the message very well about the uh, African common position, uh, the uh, Malamo um, process, and indeed we do want to support uh, Africa uh, with the post Malabo process. We, we do have now in the hub um, uh, a special um, advisor, uh, Martin, uh, that he was he is with us and he will be supporting this process. And also to, to thank David and the FAO Regional Office for Africa for all the work they do to uh, put together uh, combined assets of the uh, agencies uh, that support countries to implement their pathways. What I would like to do from our side for the next three to four minutes is to give you a kind of update where we stand uh, with the UN Food System Coordination Hub work right now and what are our plans for the next um, 18 months. As you know, one important milestone for the UN Food System Summit was the stock-taking moment that happened in Rome last July. And in this stock-taking moment, I think that we achieved to prove that countries have started to walk the talk of food system transformation pathways with very small steps. I, I could call them baby steps, but with clear indications that the countries are really following up on, the, on their own agendas that they have submitted uh, at the occasion of the UN Food System Summit. And I, I'm more and more convinced from the interaction I have the last two and a half years with the a system of national conveners that the pathways and the network of the national conveners is one of the biggest assets that the UN Food System Summit process has left to us. So we do have uh, established the evidence that countries have taken the food system transformation agendas and they have made them part of their national development strategies, their national development pathways. And, and we have seen this happening in more than two thirds of the countries that they have submitted a pathway. After uh, the stock taking moment, we um, are mandated by the UN Secretary General to continue working on supporting the conveners on implementing their pathways. And we have specific areas of work that we are focusing now, which are based in the call uh, to action of the UN Secretary General during the stock taking moment that happened in Rome. And we have started in the hub a series of flagship initiatives that we uh, we, we, we want with them to uh, support the implementation of the uh, call to action and of course the implementation of the pathways. We will have the opportunity to meet also the conveners in Africa next week uh, during the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. But let me outline um, some of the big flagships we're working right now. One is the so-called Convergence Initiative. It's uh, an initiative that came after the announcement of um, from the Deputy Secretary General during the COP28. And it's an effort to link the teams and the processes that they're working on food system transformation and climate action agendas. We had already uh, a, a virtual consultation with the national conveners from the different regions on this initiative. We are doing meetings now in the different regions, and we hope that by the end of these meetings, we will be able to come up and publish the convergence framework and how we would like to support the countries. A second is the work we need to continue to 
uh, we want to continue to do on operationalizing the pathways and providing support to countries uh, to uh, implement their pathways. And I have uh, we have already uh, a set of countries that uh, they have received some seed support from the from the hub. We have another set of countries that they will very soon receive some support from the joint SDG fund. And we expect that if our donors will support us, we'll have another group of countries that they will be receiving additional uh, seed funding for the operationalization of the pathways and for the linking with the climate agenda. We have the ambition of going to the next food system stock taking moment with at least two dozens of countries that they can showcase how they can uh, proceed with the implementation of the pathways. Another important initiative we're working is on uh, building closest uh, partnership and engagement with the private sector and working with the private sectors to, to establish a corporate accountability framework to ensure that uh, we do have also the evidence that private sector could support the food system transformations. We do have also an initiative on youth leadership for food system transformations. There was last week uh, a regional workshop that it was co-hosted by the hub and the FAO Regional Office for Africa in, in Ghana. And I do know from my colleagues that it was a very successful event where we saw the, the youth coming together and uh, really giving some promising indications that they uh, will be able to take up the, uh, the lead on food system transformation. So to summarize, um, our next milestone is the food system stock taking moment of 2025. And as the Deputy Secretary General has said, she would like to see probably this stock taking moment happening in uh, a country in the global south. Still, we don't have uh, an indication, but we would like to be in the global south. Um, in this next stock taking moment, we need to create an additional milestone and showcase what is the practical action that countries have taken on transforming their food systems. And we will be here in the hub to support this process. When it comes to Africa, I must say that Africa is emerging as a leader in the agenda of the food system transformation. We have seen a massive participation of African leaders in the stock taking moment, and we have seen a massive um, action from African countries. We are here to continue support and augment this action, and I will be looking forward to listening from you and see what additional can do in the hub to support your role. Thank you very much. Over to you, back, Khalid. Uh, thank you so much, Stefanos, for summarizing and giving an, uh, an important view of the work of the hub, uh, working with national conveners, but working also with UN agencies and with regional institutions, uh, mainly the African Union. Um, I think from the, from the three interventions, uh, there's a lot to be do done in the coming months, leading to the stock taking moment, leading to next hub. Uh, Africa has many challenges, but at the same time, a, has a lot of potential and from the from the food systems hub will continue to work closely with the UN agencies supporting the hub and with the African Union uh, to, to, to support African national convener in their work in transforming food system. With this, uh, this would conclude um, the opening session and it is my uh, pleasure to hand over to Mr. Uh, Martin Qualia, the Senior Food System Specialist for Africa, UN United Nations Food System Coordination Hub to moderate the, uh, the next session. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Khalid. I hope you can uh, hear me uh, loud and clear. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, this is the core part of the meeting. And uh, indeed, we, as uh, Stefan has just said, we would like to hear from you. And I'll say a little bit more on that one. But uh, uh, let me introduce the session very quickly. Uh, in the interest of actually that I speak very less and allow uh, the panelists and the other participants to actually interact. Over the so the uh, issue is uh, 
Why do we have this time in uh, Africa that knowledge is power? We do not underestimate the value sharing and learning from each other. And this is especially what we hope to achieve this morning, this afternoon, as well as also to continue to dialogue. Uh, we also know, and I refer to what we just heard from our able, uh, uh, opening remarks, that the issue of food systems is critical in Africa. And we have reached a stage where it is not so much about convincing each other about the importance of food systems. We, as a continent, are actually on the stage where uh, it is about uh, implementation. I think uh, I can hear some noise. Let me just check that noise. Martin, sorry, we cannot hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yes, I was saying that uh, in food systems, it's very much about implementation. And therefore, what we are looking forward to is to share and learn from each other about how we can advance actual implementation, delivering results and impact. And this is why my next point is that we can't have an able team of panelists and also the participant, participants in this meeting of uh, people on the ground in form of our national conveners and also various other stakeholders that are actually involved in the front line with actual implementation. And therefore, we look forward to this sharing. Uh, I have uh, actually an able panel of five people that are going to share with us. Yeah, I suppose I think we are making sure everyone's mic is muted. So we have a panel of a panel of five uh, panelists that are going to intervene. They will speak for about three minutes or so in the initial intervention. And uh, hopefully that will leave us enough time to have uh, interaction and conversation Sorry, with the participants uh, engaging. And uh, thereafter, we'll uh, get into the conclusion and summarizing or synthesizing the discussions. So at this point in time, let me introduce the panelists. I will introduce them one by one. Uh, 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 as, as they come in to speak. But before I do that, actually, I've just mentioned the issue of discussions uh, after the intervention of this panelist. But please feel free to send in questions in the chat, uh, comments and questions. We, are, we shall monitor that and we'll address them as much as we can. Uh, I should also mention, I think was mentioned at the beginning that there is a interpretation, French and the Arabic. So with the right uh, uh, link there, you can actually get the interpretation you, you require in case you do. So at this point, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, who is a... Martin, you seem muted again. Sorry. The first speaker is Priscilla Mururi. She's a connecting or participating from Kenya. She's the chairperson of the National Food Systems Technical Working Group uh, and also technical advisor to the cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, and Livestock in Kenya, Livestock Development in Kenya. She is actually the, the cabinet secretary is the national, national convener for food systems in Kenya. And therefore we are talking to somebody who is actually very well involved in connecting between practice and the policy. 
uh, and uh, uh, Madam Priscilla is going to share with us very briefly in that three minutes, uh, sharing one or two practices that uh, Kenya is involved in with regard to implementation of food systems initiatives uh, uh, and also within that context in terms of what is actually happening, what would be the lessons that Kenya is drawing out of these uh, this, uh, implementation processes and actions. So Madam Priscilla, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. At least I can. Okay. My, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, for this opportunity. I would like to share some insights from Kenya. And uh, in Kenya, we started off by... Um, constituting the steering committee as well as the technical work on food systems. There are tools that we are currently undertaking in pursuit to food systems. Number one, we have um, embarked on digitalization and uh, digitization. Uh, we are implementing the Kenya um, integrated Agricultural Management Information System, that is KIAMIS. And through KIAMIS, we have been able to register over 6 million farmers. In addition to that, we have also been able to map the input suppliers to farmers. And therefore, this we are doing in, um, in a bid to transform data into a service to farmers. Uh, we are currently giving um, uh, input to farmers through the e-voucher system. And uh, we have engaged innovative approaches in engaging our community. Uh, number two, we are also embarking and engaging the youth in agriculture because this is one of our prioritized pathways. You realize that in Kenya, over 70% of our population is basically youth. So what we are doing is uh, we are um, engaging the youth in uh, piloting an agripreneur model that will allow the youth to be able to work with the farmers. Number one, to provide extension services to the farmers and number two, to link farmers to both input and output markets. We are proposing to engage about 118,000 uh, young people from the counties where they live so that, that they can be able to work with the farmers. And these agripreneurs are trained agricultural um, officers, either at a certificate, diploma, or degree level but because of the high level of unemployment, currently the youth is not engaged. So what we are saying is that this is going to be a game changer because the agripreneurs will therefore be able to work with farmers and hold the farmers and at a ratio of one agripreneur, 306 farmers. So, Seeing this as a game changer, this is a policy to engage the youth. Number two, link farmers to input and output markets in a bid to increase um, their productivity as well as their production to achieve food and nutrition security. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you so much. That is very clear and actually very practical. Uh, I will not go through just now what you said, I think it's clear. Let me introduce the second uh, uh, panelist. Uh, and this is uh, Mr. Adria Shanna. Uh, I will actually endeavor to pronounce the next, the second name. It's the Radiana Vyomanana. 
Uh, I hope I got, I came close to the correct pronunciation. Uh, Adri Adria Yana is actually the managing director in charge of general coordination of projects and the partnerships in Madagascar and is actually intervening on behalf of the national convener. The floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le modérateur, et bonjour à tous les participants de ce site event. Euh, ne vous inquiétez pas, vous avez bien prononcé mon nom, même si ça a été un peu difficile. Euh, donc, euh, pour le cas de, de Madagascar, après notre participation justement au sommet de l'UNFSS plus 2 en 2023, euh, nous avons pris des engagements majeurs pour transformer nos systèmes alimentaires et, rede et relever les, les défis climatiques. Euh, concernant euh, quelques exemples de pratiques que nous mettons en œuvre justement ici à Madagascar, donc euh, il y a justement la promotion de, de l'agroécologie et de la gestion durable des ressources naturelles. Donc, un exemple concret, la promotion de la technique agroécologique qu'on vous a, inspirée du modèle zimbabwéen, qui vise à assurer l'autosuffisance alimentaire annuelle des familles. Cette technique repose notamment sur des principes tels que la perturbation minimale du sol, le maintien d'une couverture de paille, la rotation des cultures et une gestion efficace du temps et des ressources. Euh, ici à Madagascar, depuis les 100 premiers jours, après la réélection de son Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République, André Zouil, plus de 3000 ménages ont été formés. Et ces efforts vont être multipliés avec l'ambition de former un million de ménages d'ici 2025 sur tous les territoires nationaux et cela conformément à la vision du, du Président. Donc ça, c'était un exemple. Un, un deuxième exemple aussi pour Madagascar, en plus des aménagements et réhabilitations de périmètres irrigués, un autre exemple consiste ex et également à la promotion de l'entretien des réseaux hydro-agricoles qui visent à améliorer l'irrigation dans le pays. Cette initiative, au-delà de son impact sur la productivité et la production agricole, témoigne des efforts considérables de Madagascar pour réduire la vulnérabilité des agriculteurs face aux, aux conditions météorologiques extrêmes, telles que les sécheresses et les inondations, qui sont de plus en plus fréquentes en raison du changement climatique. Madagascar étant un des pays les plus affectés par, euh, par le changement climatique, si, selon les dernières euh, euh, informations, nous sommes cinquième mondial. Donc, en favorisant une utilisation et une gestion plus efficace de l'eau et en préservant les ressources naturelles telles que le sol ou les cours d'eau, cette initiative soutient également la résilience des systèmes alimentaires. Pour souligner l'importance de cette démarche, nous, ici à Madagascar, nous avons institué un événement national qui a été lancé dernièrement, c'est-à-dire un lancement officiel de la semaine d'entretien des réseaux hydro-agricoles. Hydro Donc, euh, sur la base de ces deux, deux exemples donc, que nous avons donnés, euh, nous visons vraiment à améliorer les moyens de subsistance, en particulier pour les agriculteurs, qui dans le cas de Madagascar, constituent 80% de la population totale et particulièrement des femmes et des jeunes aussi, parce que plus de 50% de la population sont des femmes et aussi des jeunes. Donc, euh, ces éléments, euh, nous pouvons les, euh, les approfondir un peu plus euh, s'il y a des questions ou des remarques venant des, des participants à ce site event. Merci infiniment. Thank you so much uh, uh, for sharing those insights and the experiences in Madagascar. 
indeed that we can see things being done that the country is not just busy being busy it is busy delivering results and your insights into that are very well appreciated so we'll come back for the discussions let me introduce the next uh, panelist and this is uh, madam asia uh, adeja she is from the Patina Sahel Consulting. Uh, Asia leads the strategic consulting and development initiatives in the Patina Sahel Consulting. And this is focused on enhancing capacity of public sector actors to formulate and implement innovative and inclusive policies uh, that uh, will increase the productivity and income of food producers, creating jobs and opportunities, as well as improve livelihoods for millions of people. She is best in, the, in Nigeria. So Asia, please, could you share next three minutes based on your experiences, what would you highlight as key enabling factors for food systems transformation uh, when it means collaborating with private sector or private entities. And please, can you go further to give us an example how you might, what are the insights in actually these efforts and how this can be shared uh, with other players in Nigeria and in other countries? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And um, so drawing from the work that we do here at Sahel Consulting and in Nigeria and other uh, countries as well, I would like to highlight three uh, major areas for private sector involvement. One is around policy coordination and creating that enabling environment. So private sector actors, especially where we work in the food and agriculture sector, need clarity on what the public sector priorities are and what the direction is, both on a national and a regional level. So it's not uncommon to see certain countries put in protectionist measures that sort of go against our common goal uh, for self-sustainable, food sustainable Africa. But you know, in some cases, that's sort of understandable because we are dealing with an emergency sort of food crisis in certain places, but we shouldn't take our eye off the food security long-term goal. So in Nigeria on the ground, we tend to see some push and pull between different uh, national actors, policy actors. So for example, you see a ministry, Ministry of Agriculture pushing for increased local production, uh, encouraging backward integration, sort of boosting that um, local production of certain staples. But on the other hand, there are ministries that are more concerned with putting pushing in trade and uh, tariff measures that sort of encourage more import of raw materials. So that sort of puts a little bit of an imbalance for private sector entities not to understand what's going on. So that's one aspect. So in terms of what we are doing on the ground to ensure coordination, currently at Sahel Consulting, we are pulling in an initiative which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on addressing bottlenecks on the early warning system for agriculture. Early warning system is very important because of the climate um, issues that we're currently facing. So what this initiative is doing is bringing in these policy actors together. So we have the Nigeria Meteorological Agency, we have the Ministry of Environment, we have the Ministry of, uh, uh, Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Food Security all together, basically to say this is our common strategy on how we are going to ensure last mile distribution of information, critical information to our smallholder farmers and business entities. So that's one example. The second thing I would like to touch on is financing. So our food system in Africa is not driven by large commercial ventures. It is driven mostly by small, medium and micro enterprises that millions and millions of them. And financing has to be geared towards these entities, no matter how small or how risky commercial uh, institutions think that financing these are. I was very happy when I heard the director of um, the UN Food System Coordination Hub talk about working with private sector and creating an accountability framework. So one aspect we must not forget is that commercial institutions, commercial banks, 
so that they really sort of understand and they understand models that have worked in financing not only cash crops, which may be deemed um, profitable, but also staple crops, fruits and vegetable and livestock value chains that actually really push for food that are essential for food and nutrition security. And finally, very mindful of time is the issue uh, private sector in Nigeria, especially cannot do without sorting out our local processing. In some value chains, we lose as much as 40% to post-harvest losses. No business is going to be sustainable and viable after that. And that further drives importation of raw materials into our landscape. So what do we need to do is we have to invest in building our supply chain. And we can only do that by identifying private sector driven models that actually work. What does that mean? So quick example is we currently have a, a project called Advancing Local Dairy Development Program in Nigeria. And what that does is it encourages local dairy processors, local businesses to source milk locally. About 90% of all dairy products in Nigeria have some form of imported milk or milk products in them. Why? This is a country that has a healthy amount of dairy cows. So why aren't we sourcing locally? So this project is essentially creating that linkage between these dairy businesses and these local producers of dairy in the country, and then putting that together while capacity building, creating advocacy, engaging all stakeholders to ensure that we are displacing imports, but then also building these small businesses. So I will stop here and then we'll see if there are any questions going on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, and indeed, we're talking about something that is really in the front line where the rubber hits the tarmac in terms of public-private engagement. Uh, and we do know that this is not an, an option, it's actually an imperative if we have to achieve the success in implementation that we're talking about. So we'll definitely develop further your points and your experiences as the a partner Sahel Consulting. At this point in time, let me introduce our next panelist. This is Emily Chazela. She's actually head of HDP, Naxes Collision Secretariat. She's working in there. Uh, and she's a program and policy officer at the World Food Program. Uh, and the head of the HDP Naxis Coalition Secretariat, as I said. Emily, please, uh, I, and we do appreciate the massive experience uh, of WFP in terms of uh, not just uh, uh, resilience and the social protection and emergencies, but also connecting with development. So could you please tell us briefly about your coalition and what some of the examples of successful integration of HDP Nexus approaches are with regard to food systems initiatives and how these experiences can inform strategic efforts in addressing complex challenges that we have to deal with in advancing food systems. So it's kind of a mouthful, but I'm sure you you understand the, the issue that would like to hear from you. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin, um, and thank you for this opportunity. So the, the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus Coalition emerged from the 2021 Food System Summit, following an observation that uh, basically conflict and peace building were largely absent from global food system discussions. And that is despite the fact that year after year, the, the global report on food crisis identify conflict as a major driver of, of uh, food system failure and of food insecurity. And so the G7 Plus, who is um, a, uh, an intergovernmental organization of uh, uh, affected countries, countries affected by food crisis and conflict. CIPRI, who is uh, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute, WFP and FAO, came together to, to try to identify a way to ensure that basically the, uh, the, the, the peace actors and the food system actors were working more closely together. And that food system interventions were not conflict blind. Because we know that 
essentially humanitarian response to food crises are essential, but they cannot provide long lasting solutions to those crises. These can only emerge from addressing the root causes of food system failures. And that includes bringing in development actors and key sectors. So what that means in practice is uh, illustrated by the work that the, the HDP Nexus Coalition has been supporting in Somalia since 2022, um, which I will summarize around three key points in uh, um, mindful of the time. So the, the first aspect that, that drove the work was that we, we wanted to ensure that everything was country driven. Um, and everything was built around partnerships. So the work of the, the, the HDP Nexus Coalition is not done in isolation. It's, it is at the request of the national convener. And also it is looking at where are the other partners that we can work with that are uh, moving in the same uh, space with, with similar objectives. So for that work, we partnered in particular with the Global uh, Network Against Food Crisis and with the Sun Movement that has already a very strong network and presence in Somalia. So that was very key. In addition, we ensured that uh, we were working under the umbrella of the uh, of a, a political commitment in the region that was driven by IGAD in 2022 to address food crisis in the um, in, in East Africa. So the, uh, the idea of work that we are doing uh, is to, to influence existing uh, initiatives rather than add new initiatives to uh, a landscape of initiatives that is already very crowded. The second aspect that I wanted to, to talk about was um, the fact that the, the way that the HDP Nexus Coalition is supporting the national uh, convener is to really start from the pathways. Um, we need to envisage the pathways as an overarching framework for food system policy, programming, and, and financing as well. And that means looking at um, looking at uh, at the the tools that we have and the mechanism around data, around coordination, planning, and financing. Um, and to make sure that when we look at those different mechanisms, the data coordination, planning and financing, we are as inclusive as possible. And this is one of the reasons that uh, the Food System, Climate and Nutrition Council that was established by the Office of the Prime Minister is such a good example of, of a, of a cross-ministerial approach to food system. One of the issues that that has been existing in the past was that the food system, the food work was very, very sectoral and did not include issues related to climate, to water, to uh, and to to social uh, social development, for instance. Um, I will uh, echo the point of Aisha and of uh, Stefanos around the need to include more private sectors, and this is one of the reasons we really want to partner more closely with the Sun as well. Um, and finally. The reason why the, the HDP nexus wants to approach, uh, wants to use a, a humanitarian development peace nexus approach to food system is that when we're looking at the drivers of hungers and, and, and food system programming at large, there's a mismatch between the fact that conflict and social unrest are primary drivers, but are mostly unaddressed in food system programming and food system financing. So what we did in Somalia, for instance, was to look at the th a risk mapping of uh, of um, what would affect the food system intervention and a collective outcome exercise with local stakeholders. And that was very evident that the risks were identified as conflict and climate. The, the food system intervention were mostly technical intervention that were not really looking at those drivers. So the role of the coalition here is to to take that finding, to bring it to its membership and to mobilize expertise to support the national and the country-based actors to make sure that at least programming is at the minimum conflict sensitive, but also that food system intervention can also contribute to peace wherever feasible. Thank you very much. I'll stop here for now. Thank you so much for that insight and uh, indeed actually crossing into the area of conflicts. Uh, and also, as you're saying that, uh, how do we get to, we have to get to the root causes. Otherwise, we keep mopping the floor and let the water pouring out. So we'll definitely develop that further. Thank you so much, uh, um, Emily. So let me uh, call on the last panelist. Uh, and this is uh, none other than Elizabeth Mwenda. And the special part of this is that uh, there has been mentioned actually also in the opening remarks, the role and the place of the youth. 
again, is not uh, like laboring outside our stock, but uh, one of the imperatives is actually youth being part of the equation, both the problem, the solution, and indeed what we're talking about here is how we capitalize on the energy, on the resilience, on the efforts of the youth in driving even accelerated, expanded transformation in the food systems. So Elizabeth is a youth representative in the UNFC Coordination Hub team or stakeholder. Uh, and she's uh, uh, working actually in Tanzania, in, in Kenya, sorry, uh, in an agricultural, she's actually an agricultural engineer in terms of training uh, and has been involved both in public and private sector, uh, working with rural communities to enhance actually their resilience with regard to especially climate change. And therefore, uh, what Elizabeth brings here is actually a lot of insights related to agriculture, food security, climate change, and indeed what are the youths doing and how are they embracing these challenges and actually participating in delivering solutions. Elizabeth, uh, please, can you share with us an example of the project that uh, integrated youth perspective and the bottom-up approaches into agri-food systems transformation in Kenya. And what would you share as actually take away from this effort in terms of sharing with your peers, sharing with the, with the other national conveners and the players that are involved in advancing food systems transformation in Kenya and also in other countries. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, for giving me the floor. I would like to I'd like to start by echoing the sentiments given by Ms. Priscilla, who is actually the chair of the technical working group in Kenya. But the youth indeed actually make up over 70% of Kenya's population. And therefore their meaningful engagement in food systems transformation can actually not be overemphasized or underscored enough. It is actually my pride to see that the youth are being prioritized as one of the five pathways for food systems transformation in my country, Kenya. My definition of bottom-up approach is co-creation. One case of a best practice of how this has been put to action in my country is the National Agricultural Rural Inclusive Growth Project, whereby the youth at the grassroots were engaged from the very beginning during the project identification phase. For example, an example of the different uh, components of the project would be on agribusinesses, which were anchored on agro-processing and value addition of agricultural produce uh, in the dominant value chains in their local context. So what could I take away from such an engagement? One, this kind of an approach actually brought a unique perspective of the youth in the program uh, project co-creation and co-designing. Therefore, with such a unique perspective, it gives a sense of ownership to the youth that were involved, which now leads to sustainability of this project even beyond the implementation phase. This now takes away the likelihood of such an in initiative uh, going under after the implementation phase is over. And two is the fact that this, kind of project prioritized youth employment. We know that currently it's pretty high given um, the declining um, economic uh, and also you know, the crisis that are ongoing in different developing countries, Kenya being one of them. And so we see that when we involve the youth, we create employment for them and we are actually not only uh, hitting the goal on SDG2 targets, but also having a ripple effect on employment as well. So this is my key takeaway to other national conveners from other countries that it is important to involve the youths when we are creating these kinds of programs and projects. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, indeed those insights are appreciated. Uh, Actually, in the interest of time, and we're looking at the questions also 
presented in the in the chat box. There are a number of them that we can actually respond even in writing and the communication after this session, including I see one question about how to join the technical working groups related to the post Malabo cut-up. That information will definitely be available. But at this point in time, uh, let me open the floor for three questions. I think we could manage at least three questions. So let me open the floor for three questions uh, for the panelists. Uh, and once we do that, then we'll see if there's uh, any more time. Please put up your hand uh, if you would like to, to uh, present a question. And uh, uh, we, you can also mention if you are directing specifically to any of the panelists uh, so that we can actually respond to your question. We'll take the three questions at the same time before we give to the panelists. So the floor is open. I see a hand from, oh no, that was the interpreter. Um, I don't see any hands. Uh, is Godfrey still online? Yes, Martin, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Could you share just a bit on how somebody can join the technical working groups? Yes. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing um, what we are calling the co conveners. So for each of the 13 technical working groups would like to have uh, joint conveners, uh, one from uh, a research academic background, and then uh, another one from the uh, practice background. In other words, combining uh, both technical and practice. So those should be identified by um, the end of this week or sometime next week. And then we are going to create a specific website for the post process, and all this information will be will be posted. Uh, we are also developing guidelines for participation in each of those technical working groups. So once all that information is uh, complete and compiled, uh, we'll put it to, to the public, and the public can um, uh, decide which of the technical working groups they would like to, uh, to participate in. So that is one. Second. Um, given that there may be other interests, uh, specific interests, for example, of, um, of the youth, uh, of women organizations, or farm organizations, other civil society, we are also creating um, a platform and we'll be organizing webinars specifically dedicated to the uh, consultations with those specific interest groups. Third, uh, we are also uh, allowing what we are calling independent memoranda. There may be interest groups that are interested in specific aspects of the post Malaba agenda, and they want their, voice, their voices to be heard, their inputs to be considered. So we'll be accepting uh, independent submissions. But all those the guidelines, uh, Martin, um, are going to be provided in the next one or two weeks, and uh, they will be available on the website so that people can follow and decide how they would like to make their contribution to the post Malabocada process. Over. Thank you so much. So I see a number of hands. So we'll go in that order. We'll start with Samira. Then we'll come to Hawa. Hawa. Then uh, Amele. Amele and uh, we'll end with the uh, honest, Kesi honest. So if we can start in that order, uh, uh, very briefly, please, please Samira, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Martin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much for this um, uh, 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 webinar, which is being um, very interesting. Um, just to uh, to say that I'm from the Resilient Local Food Supply Chains Alliance, one of the coalitions um, based in WFP. And um, Martin, you know, we interacted at the very beginning of the Food System Summit process back in 2021. Um, I'm glad to also see that honest Dr. Kesey is, is, is here because as you know, our, our coalition um, is made up of food systems conveners in mainly our main supporters are in Africa and also um, a few in Asia. But we have, um, our, our, our real background is linked to the um, African Common Position um, paper and the CADEP, especially for the countries in Africa. And those are key areas in making strong local food supply chains. And of course, we all know um, what that entails, and that looks at it from the food security and food nutrition um, perspective. But I just want to comment quickly on the youth aspect, because a couple of people have spoken about youth, and we have a good, strong youth um, um, following within the, the Alliance, and they tell us that they want to be more involved in food systems transformation. They want to be more involved in agri-food um, supply, increasing our food supplies, but not just on farm, but off farm um, businesses as well. We have, and in fact, we've engaged and um, encourage youth through our youth dialogues. Uh, we've had three to engage with youth from Latin America, from Africa, and from Asia, where they exchange knowledge and, and their startups. And one of the main problems they have is access to credit. And some of them have even started their businesses not knowing how they can access credit. And we have been able to bring um, a couple of banks, regional banks um, in Benin, um, national banks and regional banks, Echo Bank and the CDD um, banks in Benin. Um, and we want to know what the governments can do because in terms of the policy um, interventions that can be made, you know, some sort of facilities need to be made for these young people to be able to access small amounts of credit, not an awful lot to start up their businesses. As they tell us, they don't want to see um, their work in the agri-food sector as a side hustle. They want to be fully involved. In fact, we have one of our main supporters is a young entrepreneur who spoke at the Food System Summit Plus Two, um, who is JR Farms, and he has businesses in Nigeria in Zambia and in Rwanda. And that is an example of the way to go for young people in um, in Africa, in the agri-food sector. Over, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Samira, thank you for those uh, remarks. I'm sure they're very clear. Shall we go to Hawa? Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm Hawa from the Women in Agriculture for Sustainable Development in Liberia. Um, and I'm really happy to be joining um, this webinar for this great conversation. Um, <clears throat> so my my question is, though we're really talking about youth and the food system, but I wanted to know what are some of the initiatives that have been directed, you know, towards women? Because if you look at the African food system or you look at the the, the majority of people especially in my country. It is the women that are merely involved in the production of food crops. You will see men involved in, you know, cash crops like rubber, cocoa, and all of that. But it is the women that, you know, produce the day-to-day -day, uh, food that we eat. So what are some of the strategies um, of inclusion, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that their contribution is visible and that they they are able to benefit from whatever that is happening in terms of access to information and all of that. I also like to mention that in 2021, the Women in Agriculture for Sustainable Development, the institution that I work with, was one of those, you know, organizations that work, that held an independent dialogue 
in Liberia. So I want to know how women, you know, what what at what level are women are really really being involved in this? Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll take that question. We'll come back to it in a moment. Can we get the question from Amela? Bonjour à tous. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui. Allô? Oui? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Merci. Euh, je vous remercie pour cette opportunité. Je m'excuse d'abord du retard parce que j'avais une confusion dans les horaires. Je pensais que c'était 11h30 GMT, ce qui correspond à 12h30 chez nous, mais j'ai pu quand même rattraper euh, les différentes communications. Et je remercie d'abord euh, tout, euh, tous ceux qui nous ont partagé les communications des différents pays, Madagascar, Kenya et autres. Et euh, ce qui a retenu mon attention, c'est l'intervention de euh, Madame Émile, Émilie Chazen. Euh, je me suis sentie particulièrement concernée parce que je pense qu'on est dans la même configuration, même si on commence à sortir euh, euh, de, de, de l'urgence en Somalie. Et ce qui m'intéresse, c'est cette approche-là euh, d'aider les pays à... Euh, qui sont dans ces configurations de conflits et de changements climatiques. Euh, J'ai trouvé ça très pertinent comme appui parce que effectivement, malgré tous les efforts qui sont déployés, il y a toujours euh, la problématique de l'insécurité euh, qui, euh, qui freine les, les progrès. Et donc, je voulais savoir quelles sont les conditions pour euh, cette organisation euh, d'intervenir dans un pays. Merci. Thank you so much. That is a specific question for Emily. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But let's get uh, honest, Casey, to uh, present his question before we give the panelists the floor to the spot. Casey, uh, please go ahead. Hello, Honest. Do we still have Honest online? Okay, we'll give him a chance when he, he comes on. Uh, for the moment, let's proceed to afford the panelists the chance to respond. Uh, Samira, that was a, a comment well taken. There's a question about women involvement. Uh, uh, I suppose any of the panelists can take that. And uh, I do recognize that probably we didn't mention women in, in any way, we've mentioned the youth. But obviously, I think it goes without saying uh, the importance of all the constituencies uh, in terms of men, women, youth, in terms of delivering on this agenda. So any of the panelists willing to take that up? In, uh, in, yeah. a, in a half a minute, please go ahead, uh, Alicia. Yes, please, half a minute. So strategies for inclusion, women inclusion. So in the livestock sector, dairy value chain where I work, there is a saying in our local language that the milk belongs to the women, but the cow belongs to the men. So already you begin to see the separation as to who owns the productive assets and then who owns, never mind the fact that it is the women that actually do the work of tending to the cows, milking, taking care of the animals, feeding. But you see how the contribution of women is minimalized. So in terms of these strategies for inclusion, one is we have to start well, we'll do a top and bottom approach, the policy document. So in Nigeria, our work has actually pushed for the development of a national dairy policy, the first ever. And what that does is actually highlights inclusion criteria for any and every implementation that is to be done in the livestock sector. So that's inclusion basically for women and then for youth as well. So that is sort of setting the context and then secondly, is also around 
visibility. Visibility is very important because it is only when we actually celebrate and pinpoint the activities of women that are doing incredible work in these um, value chains that we can begin to actually understand what is happening. So I am happy that uh, Madame Hawa mentioned that the um, the body that she represents is actually holding dialogues and showcasing the contribution of women. And finally, another strategy for inclusion, uh, and it's for every partner that is actually on this call, for any program, any intervention that you are running, put in a criteria that mandates partnering with women-owned or women-led agribusinesses or SMEs or organizations. Because the minute you do that, you begin to actually push that from the very top of the leadership and all the way down to where the boots actually hit the ground. So th those, those are my interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response, uh, Alicia. Let's get to the question of conflict, uh, Emily. And uh, I think that was a very specific question. How do we intervene and connect between the issues of conflict, uh, 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 social security as well? but also connecting to development way. Please go ahead. So, I mean, I think there was also a question related to how how the the HTP Nexus coalition can support specifically the RCA. So, um, so from from as I mentioned in my intervention, we always start from a request from the country. So, if there is a, a need within the uh, Central African Republic republics here to um, to for support from the Nexus co coalition, then we we are more than happy to 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 connect. Um, the way that we are usually uh, operating is that we are we trying to uh, make sure that we are building partnership with our with our, our close partner like the hub and the and the um, and the global network against food crisis, and then we we look at um, understanding the 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 pathways between conflict and food system failures. So there are many ways that the way that, you know, natural resources are managed, for instance, can lead to social unrest and eventually conflict, or the way that uh, that's a water resource, et cetera, or the way that the markets are functioning, in addition to having the usual conflict like we have in Sudan like at the moment, which is impacting very much um, uh, not only the food system, but also of the place that are directly affected by the conflict, but also the food system of the place that are hosting a lot of ITPs. So understanding those pathways helps um, uh, shape the, the type of policy response that is and programming that is needed. And that's something that we can, we can we're happy to support um, Ms. Uh, Siopatis if, uh, if that's something that would be helpful for, for the for CER. Um, in addition to that, we, as part of the coalition, we are going to build a very uh, strong knowledge management uh, component um, to make sure that the work that we are doing in Somalia and, and soon in Ethiopia and South Sudan can also help other countries by developing a webinar, maybe a, a community of practice across uh, interested national conveners um, to ensure that we, um, we we are also disseminating the learnings that, uh, that are built from the different different country-based experience. But it's very important for us also to be very country-specific as well. So that's why I think we might want to follow up offline with uh, with Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Siopatis. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are actually getting to near the end of our time. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, as I said at the beginning, this is not an event, it's actually part of the process. There has been work things before. There will continue to be things work uh, after this session. And what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the conversation doesn't end in this uh, uh, session. Uh, and the hub is actually very available should you want to connect to any of the panelists or even across some of the participants, feel free to proceed in that connection. And if in the hub we can help, we can facilitate, feel free to connect with us. The session has been indeed very enriching. There has been a, no, a number of issues actually that have come up. Uh, as I said, connecting with implementation, connecting with delivering results. There's the issue of inclusiveness in terms of stakeholders and partners. Issues of government leadership has come up. 
issues of actually going to the root causes. And this is about transformation uh, and changing the way we think, the way we do things. Uh, and that can't happen if you are not dealing with the root causes. Issue of data uh, and digitalization of technology in general uh, has been highlighted. Uh, and also, where are the pathways and where do you start from? And that is starting with the pathways. It's also about starting from what matters for the countries. Because in the pathways, the countries have expressed what is their priorities, what is the issue, and how do they wish to proceed in terms of addressing the whole food systems transformation. So we start, start with what the countries have and are doing. Uh, there was a point about uh, staying uh, in sight of long-term goals, and again, that is about transformation. Uh, one thing that was also mentioned was the issue of uh, agripreneurs and actually the commercial value. It came from more than one uh, panelist, and this is important. And actually, in the, as we think through and as we proceed on those, let's also look at how are we connecting between the commercial value the social value, the environmental value, and actually because these are energy sports that uh, support each other in terms of interdependencies to governize that implementation we are looking at. And I would like, especially when you look at the constituencies like farmers, uh, like input suppliers, so the whole issue around commercial value is a key decision point, and that has to come out clear all the time. So I want to, uh, on behalf of the Hub, to thank all the panelists. Uh, very well appreciated your insights, your practical experiences, and we will definitely continue to connect with you in terms of learning from your experiences uh, and look forward to actually more and more engagement. Uh, as some of you may be aware, we have a regional national conveners meeting on the 22nd, and a lot of these things we shall drill down further. So at this point in time, without wasting any more time, let me call upon uh, Stephans, uh, our director, to actually provide his closing remarks. Stefan, the floor is yours. Martin, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the excellent summary of this uh, panel. And um, I don't want to repeat what you said, but I want to stand in one point that this is not the end of the conversation. Um, it's a continuous process. And um, indeed, the, the colleagues, they need to, to contact you to see how uh, we take some of these ideas uh, on our way on how we are supporting the food system national conveners and the region, of course, on achieving its objectives on food system transformations. And um, I, I want to share with everybody that Africa is the first region that we do have uh, a senior advisor of the hub sitting there because uh, we, we do understand the importance of this region on the food system transformations, but we see also the leadership of the region. I want to say that um, I think that the UN Food System Summit process has given to Africa uh, really a very important role in the global table of uh, UN negotiations when it comes to food systems. And I think that um, Africa has really um, provided a leadership and has shown that um, institutional change can happen uh, when there's the right combination of political will and a very good engagement of different actors, different stakeholders, and different government departments. I know that there's a lot of things that they still need to be done, but we are very hopeful on, on how Africa will continue to emerge as a leader on agri-food system transformations for the acceleration of the sustainable development goals. There's some big milestone in front of us, uh, next week, of course, there's the uh, Regional Forum of Africa on Sustainable Development and the conveners meeting in, in Africa. Both um, you, Martin, and, and Khaled will be there uh, with other colleagues, and we are looking forward to a, a very active debate there uh, that you will give us idea, ideas on how to detail the work from our, of the hub for the next 18 months and in the next stock-taking moment. We'll have, of course, the high-level political forum on, uh, on sustainable development in July, the summit for the future in September, uh, the COP on biodiversity and the COP on climate. And I think these are big milestones where we will need to see how the food system agenda and how a regional perspective uh, from Africa is, is really staying very 
up and it's influencing, um, if you want, what would be the outcome documents of this um, of these processes. I want to emphasize the importance of the HLPF and the Summit for the Future. And I would like to ask with any connections that any one of you has with your governments that actually they are the ones that they are negotiating the outcome documents of these processes to, um, uh, to, to, to really advocate towards including a strong reference to the food systems, to the food system summit, to the work we are doing uh, with the hub and the stakeholders and the governments on this. So we make sure that we have also the legislative mandate from uh, the UN to continue our work. So uh, a very big thank to all uh, the panelists and all the audience here. And uh, we're looking forward to additional engagements. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you to everybody who participated. And as we said, looking forward to further engagement. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.